Hello, Internet. My name is Daniel Whoa, Brian, and welcome to another episode of Obsessive Pop Culture Disorder, the show that... A show that, like, if it had t-shirts, would you buy one? Would you buy and wear a shirt that said Obsessive Pop Culture Disorder on it in a, in a cool way? Would you buy that? I've been making these videos for, like, five years, and they're only gonna let me keep making them if they turn a profit, so, like... T-shirts? Is that a dumb idea? Gut says yes. Anyway, today's episode uncovers... Hey, looks like someone crunched the numbers and found out that videos with bizarrely specific in the title did better on average than other videos, so let's dig in. Movies with plans or schemes have a hard task in front of them. On the one hand, they need to set up the scheme, Ocean's Eleven style, to inform the audience what every character is supposed to be doing to pull off their heist. On the other hand, they need to throw in a few false positives, red herrings, and misdirections so the audience can still be surprised and satisfied by the end. In rehearsal, Ocean's Eleven will show the audience every step of their plan in advance. Except the part of the plan where Carl Reiner believably fakes a heart problem. At 31, I got a bogey in West Corridor. Just call a doctor! Or when George Clooney gets detained. Do you have a hand in this? Did I have my hand in what? They build a realistic plan and then throw most of it out to make it frog shit impossible to follow in the interest of surprising the audience. Man, movies do so much to surprise and please me, and all I do is tell them they're wrong. Do you think I'm the abusive one in this relationship? Anyway, here are some bizarrely specific movie plans that shouldn't have worked. At the end of Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo gets frozen in carbonite and sent to Jabba the Hutt as a trophy slash prisoner. I mean, it's not a trophy in the way that a standard deer head is a trophy because the deer is dead and Han's still alive. And it's not a prisoner in the way that a standard prisoner is a prisoner because you can't, like, torture or gloat at or rehabilitate or otherwise interact with frozen Han. Essentially, all you're doing is preserving Han with no overhead costs so Han could, he could theoretically live in suspended carbonite for a hundred years. He can outlive you, Jabba, but let's ignore that for this episode and definitely make sure we include it in a future episode. So Han's trapped in a thing and literally all of his buddies have come to help him out in one of the most famous rescue missions ever filmed. Let's really break down what he and all of his buddies are doing for this plan. For this plan to work perfectly, Han needs to get unfrozen, recaptured, and then positioned right in front of a gigantic monster pit made of eating. His robot friends needed to at one point show up and pose as service droids for Jabba. R2-D2 has Luke's lightsaber in his belly. That's important. His on-again, off-again princess girlfriend, the one who freed him from Carbonite and also murdered Jabba, needed to first show up as a dangerous bounty hunter, and then she needed to get found out and captured and turned into a slave girl. His closest friend bear, Chewie, needed to pretend to be a prisoner of that bounty hunter. His new little buddy Luke needed to show up, use magic, get captured, and when the magic failed, get thrown thrown into a pit with a monster, kill the monster, and then get re-imprisoned so that he too could be placed in front of a gigantic monster pit made of eating. At some point, his buddy, Lando, gets a security job at Jabba's Palace and ends up pulling guard duty when all the big stuff goes down. It all mattered. R2-D2, Lando, Luke, Leia, and Chewie were all instrumental in Han's dramatic escape, but why? And how could a well-executed plan involve Luke getting captured twice? Leia strangled Jabba to death, but they ended up blowing up his palace, meaning he would have died anyway. Meaning, what the f*** was she even doing there? Was her role just unfreeze Han? Because if so, get someone else for that step of the plan. Because if the plan just ended up involving cool lightsaber magic, did we need actual princess slash general becomes bikini-clad slave briefly as one of the steps? And Lando, how long did he work at Jabba's palace undercover for a plan that is essentially take the thing I want and then blow up everything else. Because remember, their plan ended up being fight everybody who is bad. And instead of just having Luke, Lando, Leia, and Chewie charge in with all their weapons, they deliberately chose a plan that forced them to disarm and in some cases wear a metal slave bathing suit. And it worked, but like, why? Just stick close to Chewie and Lando. They're taking care of everything. Oh, great. The Dark Knight is my third favorite Batman movie after Tim Burton's Batman, and you ready for this? The Lego Batman movie, Fight Me. It's in my top three because it's fun and good, but mostly because Heath Ledger's Joker is so good and watchable. He's so good and watchable that it actually distracts you from the many ridiculous plot holes in this movie. Joker gets captured by Batman and the Jim Gordon that everyone thought was dead, but then he escapes prison because he installed a bomb in the belly of a guy he knew was also going to get arrested. And at some point, he captured Rachel Dawes and Harvey Dent and stored them in explosive-filled warehouses on opposite sides of town. He did this because he wanted to torture Batman, let him think he caught Joker so he could meanwhile kill Rachel or Harvey. Didn't seem to matter. Somebody had to die, probably. Maybe. I have never coordinated, and will never coordinate, anything that complex. Joker, an agent of chaos, a guy who claims to not have a plan, planned enough to know that he was going to be captured and put into prison at the same time that another guy was in prison with a bomb in his gut while Joker's henchmen were making sure that Rachel and Harvey were trapped in their various warehouses. Rachel gets killed, Harvey becomes Two-Face, which motivates the final act of the plot, and Joker ends up escaping to continue the rest of his day. 
The plan depends on Joker getting caught, meaning it depends on Gordon surprising him by being alive. And it also relies on the Gotham Police Department having corrupt officers that Joker could coerce and manipulate. What if Joker didn't randomly get caught by a suddenly alive Gordon and a bat motorcycle? What if he successfully rocket launched Batman to death, as was his plan? Would he have just kept living, causing trouble? while Harvey and Rachel blew up, affecting no one? We still have done the, the boat thing? We'll never know, because luckily, the Joker's plan worked, wherein works means literally a few good people died and Batman was kinda sad for a short amount of time. We know from Dark Knight Rises that Joker's second eventual capture led to an unprecedented period of peace and safety in Gotham until Bane showed up. Like, Joker did his thing, which sure, killed Harvey Dent and Rachel Dawes, but he essentially dissolved the Mafia made Batman irrelevant, and inspired Gordon to retire because there wasn't enough crime in Gotham. Cool plan, you painted up butthole. Star Wars again? Maybe these movies are bad. Okay. The Star Wars prequels aren't known for their anything positive. And sure, they're all bad. But the ridiculousness of Emperor Palpatine's career plan gets special distinction for being so specifically bad. Like bad in a way that takes work, not just lazy bad. The Emperor, aka Darth Sidious, aka Sheev Palpatine, a Sheev? Really? Ugh, George, ugh. Anyway, at the start of Phantom Menace, Sheev is leading a double life as both Darth Sidious, the evil Sith Lord, and Sheev Palpatine, the charismatic senator from Naboo, a f***ing mostly water planet, I think, that seems important for some reason. He didn't assume someone else's identity, by the way. He's an active senator who is very distinguished and well-liked by his constituents and his fellow senators alike. He has earned the trust of the Queen of Naboo. He's vocal about how much he loves democracy. I love democracy. Meanwhile, He's behind the scenes convincing the corrupt trade federation to f***ing invade Naboo or whatever. This leads to chaos, or not chaos, confusing political bureaucracy, which Sheev uses to persuade the Senate to get rid of Supreme Chancellor Valorum. And then, does anyone like these movies? And then he gets himself appointed Supreme Chancellor, which he accepts humbly and with tremendous regret. In Attack of the Clones, Wikipedia says he exploits constitutional loopholes to remain in office even after the official expiration of his term. Whew. Does anyone else rock hard over here or what? While his alter ego, Darth Sidious, convinces rogue Jedi, now Sith, Count Dooku, to convince a bunch of planets to secede from the Republic and form a new confederacy of independent systems. They start building a droid army. Palpatine grants himself emergency powers in addition to his constitutional mind and lightning powers, initiates the creation of a clone army, so the whole galaxy, which was once in near perfect harmony, is now fighting itself in a droid versus clone battle that is run on both sides by Palpatine, the guy who wants control, but somehow doesn't know he already has it. Palpatine then gets his ass captured by some droid separatists on purpose and has Anakin murder Count Dooku, remember him? And so now he has control of the Senate and also I guess runs the separatists? Then they kill all the Jedi, including and especially the babies. And then Sheev Sidious Palpatine re, re, uh, re, reorganizes the universe so that these two opposing factions are now are all together. They stop fighting, they go back to how things were like before, only now he's in charge of all of it. And then he has a Death Star built it's like, what if some mother ever wants to step to him with an equally convoluted plan? Spoiler alert, the opposition will never have an equally convoluted plan. They have the one plan, it's the, the blow up the Death Star plan, that's it. Now, if you're still with us, you, like me, are confused. Why would the Emperor manufacture a war that half of him was bound to lose? Why would he want total control over the galaxy if the only thing he seemed to want is the ability to blow up planets with the Death Star? How would he know that the path to owning the galaxy runs through him being the beloved senator of a sh frog planet in peacetime for years? I am the Senate. Remember, the reason the Senate allowed him to get total control over everything means that they trusted him, meaning he did something to distinguish himself and appear to be an incorruptible politician for years. I want to run the galaxy one day, which means a lot of great work in the local political sector of a sh frog planet for like a decade. Also, his plan relied on Anakin killing a bunch of people to help consolidate his power and wipe out the Jedi competition. Anakin killed Dooku, cut off Mace Windu's arm, and slaughtered a ton of Jedi children. He was integral to the plan. How could Palpatine have a plan that by design required a magic baby to just appear on his doorstep one day? Setting aside for a moment the fact that the plan makes no sense. Palpatine, Sidious, Sheev, what are you even in this for? You're a gross pale goblin that everyone hates and now you've got a bunch of clones and robots and huts you don't know what to do with. Are you just sitting around waiting for Jedi to kill? Find a hobby. Look at birds or get good with f***ing knots or something. Write a book about your time in politics, profiles in Coruscant. I don't give a shit. You built Death Stars to fight the Rebellion. The Rebellion only exists because you took the entire galaxy, tore it apart, and then rebranded it as the Empire. Those people were fine. The Republic will be reorganized into the first galactic empire. Star Wars movies are like bad. I dated a woman a few years ago who had never seen any of them before, and I was like, what? Stop, we're watching all of them right now. Like that was the date. 
we laid down on my couch watching the original trilogy, and we finished Empire, and she was like, should we do the next one now? And I was like, actually, you can skip it. Because, actually, you can skip it. If you think Star Wars is perfect, watch it with someone who has never seen it before and try to explain to them why it's perfect. And you'll realize it's just mostly like, eh, but I love it, but like, eh, I'm so happy it's part of my life and pop culture history. But Skywalker and Solo were never cool names. They were busy, load-bearing names, way too on the nose. Can't wait for the standalone Solo movie, though. Or the next two in the new trilogy, or whatever other Star Wars movies come out from between now and when I die, which will be never. I'll see them all. You could skip them. Anyway, that's all for now. Join us next month when our topic will be... The show sells a ton of t-shirts, so much so that we don't need to do the show anymore? Oh. You've put me in quite the difficult position in a show that seems to know the future. Okay. So I need a bunch of you to buy t-shirts and duffel bags and whatever the f else we're selling these days. But I need some of you to not do that, because we need to stay hungry or else we'll get lazy. So, audience, uh, divide yourself in half, and half of you buy stuff. For the rest of you, next month's episode will be about... I don't know, flubber? Anyway, bye. Hey, thanks for watching that video. If you want to subscribe, hit that big C in the middle. And if you want to watch more videos, hit one of the boxes on the right. I can verify that they're all the best. Also, don't forget to hit the stupid little bell icon so YouTube will notify you when we have a new video. And if you'd like my autograph, just fake it on something. No one will know. Who's going to know?